Charles has been at the lab since 2005, first to assist with the home study course in bird biology, and then to manage Sapsucker Woods, the visitor center, and events like the Monday night seminar series. So he should feel right at home tonight. Welcome home, Charles, to, to Monday night seminars. Uh, he's been the bird camps project leader since 2012, and to many of you really needs no introduction. So, Charles. Well, you know, I'm used to standing uh, on the other side of this, giving that little speech often for, um, for speakers. And it's really exciting to be standing up here in a slightly different way. Um, still seeing many of the same faces. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, still seeing many of the same faces that I remember. Uh, friends of old, as I was told to say, not old faces. Um, and uh, excited to share something that I think many of you here at least are at least you know, somewhat acquainted with. And I wanted to start out first by, by mentioning that not only do we have Miyoko in this room, <coughs> who is my supervisor and really helps guide the entire strategy of this, of this whole project, but we're lucky enough as well to have our communications specialist, Victoria Campbell, here. And so I just wanted to point her out because uh, Miyoko, go ahead and stand up and, you know, take a wave. And <laughs> um, really, you're gonna find that throughout this talk, I'm not going to talk about things that I did. I'm going to talk about things that we did. And that's largely because you don't, you don't create a project like this and have it be successful in the way we've been without a lot of help. And uh, it's great to start out talks, I feel like, with acknowledgments. And I couldn't have done this project alone. We have a stellar group of web professionals who do everything from design and programming to uh, you know, very creative things about trying to make this equipment work. We have a communication team that's probably bar none in the world of birds, um, dealing both online and print. We have uh, people in the building that, you know, literally hands-on helped install some of this equipment as well as on campus with facilities. And then we have people, the viewers, the members, the chatters, you know, who in this room has watched these camps? You want to raise a hand? <laughs> okay. And then of the people who've watched the camps, how many of you have chatted, actually logged into chat and typed? Okay. And how many of you never typed but you read it anyway? Okay? Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's really, I think, what a lot of this is about. There's probably some chatters, uh, I'm thinking, watching this online right now, and, and if, if you ever have questions during the talk, or um, if you just want to share your thoughts, there's an online chat going on right now, um, or maybe not right now. It's full. It's full. So <laughs> if you're looking for a chance to chat, um, you came late to the party, I guess. Uh, but we'll hopefully get to your questions as people bore with what I'm saying and they drop out. Uh, so tonight, um, what I want to do is uh, share something, try and share parts of this whole experience that you haven't seen, share some things that you may have seen, but maybe in a new light, share some things that were special. The only time I'll really talk about me is some of these highlights that I've chosen that really spoke to me. And a lot of them came from last year because it was just the first year and it was the first time I had seen something. There's a couple from this year. And then sort of a larger picture of kind of what, what, what's, what's happening because of all these CAMs. Um, you know, what's the outcome? Why are we doing this? So, um, you know, there's, there's a fair bit of ground to cover in today's talk, um, including some of this footage that I'm talking about. So I want to give you just a, a general roadmap. Um, I'm going to sort of start out with just a brief bit about the Cornell Lab and why we're doing CAMs, because some people, especially that are online, might not actually be aware of everything. You know, they're not sitting here in the audience of inside a building that's 90,000 square feet in the middle of Sapsucker Woods. We're very grounded in place. You guys are, are you made the trek here in rain, and uh, I love seeing your faces out there, but you guys know us pretty well already, otherwise you wouldn't come here in the rain. Um, and then we'll, we'll deal with some behind the scenes uh, stuff, and then talk a little bit about what I think of as a new way of observing birds. This idea that something that people, I think, traditionally would call a virtual experience. You know, you go online, you do something virtually, you know, but we're not actually doing something virtual. That's something I'll argue again and again. We are actually watching something real together. And that's a, that's a much more powerful thing, I think, than, than calling it a virtual experience. It has the same kind of potential for impact, life-changing um, emotion as watching, you know, an important speech from a political figure online, or not online, but, but on a TV, for example, where you're watching in real time together spread out across the country. 
Um, you hear people talk about sporting events that you know they can still remember from when they were young that made them feel incredibly joyous. Th these cameras are not virtual experiences, and I'll, I'll go to my, cra my grave saying that. What they are is basically a distributed experience that's shared by people across the world in real time. And, and really, this is the first time in our history that we have the ability to do that. And, uh, and, it, and it can lead to some very powerful things. So I'll preface this by saying I drank a cup of coffee almost two hours ago now. So I'm, I'm going to try and rein in my loquaciousness and so we can make it through this talk and get to some questions. <clears throat> Before getting into some of the nitty gritty of the cams, I also wanted to take a second to reflect on birds, you know? What is it about birds that drives a 55,000 member institution like the, like the lab? What is it that drives people like yourselves to come out in the middle of the night in the rain to watch a talk about something that you could sit at home and watch even at this point? Um, and then how can we get more people to care about them? And really, it's, uh, it's clips like this that, that speak a little bit to, to that experience. I'm going to try and turn up the volume. You can almost feel that wind whipping through your hair, if you have hair. There's the joke. <laughs> okay. But an image like that, like that really, uh, in my opinion, it's really the essence of what I'm talking about with this project. It captures at once the beauty and the resilience of those birds. You can see the passion, literally, like in their eyes. Um, and I don't know how long you've watched birds. I've seen herons since I was young. It was mentioned by Miyoko that I, you know, since I was four, looking for a sausage breakfast. But the ability for us to stick a camera there and literally be on their shoulder, perched there, seeing the world from their view is a new thing, I'll argue. And especially for these birds that might nest up very high in the sky. So I, I keep that as a context for why we do that. We're connecting people to birds, we're making them aware of birds, and we're building that connection by providing them an experience they couldn't get otherwise. And that, that's the same for seasoned scientists, birders, Bird watchers, I know there's people that make it distinguished, people who've never seen birds before. We're bringing them an experience that's new, and that's where the power lies. So let's take a step back. <clears throat> what is the lab of Horn Cornell Lab of Ornithology? And uh, we're a nonprofit membership bird conservation organization. We have a mission statement uh, to conserve and interpret birds and biodiversity through research, education, and citizen science. We were founded almost 100 years ago. 1915, our centennial is coming up. And we're a global leader in bird conservation, citizen science, and outreach, um, as well as in things like technology. So going back all the way to 1929, we were at the forefront of using technology that, to record birds that wasn't designed to record birds. We had a movie industry in town. We had people up here that wanted to record birds. They got together, went down to Stewart Park, and made the first bird recordings in the world, OK? We have a long history of bending technology to our will and making it useful for birds, for studying them, and for making people aware. And so, although the CAMS project might seem like a new thing, the spirit that drives it is actually, you know, really central to the lab's DNA. And you can think of it, you know, the way those records of those first bird songs made their ways across the country into people's houses and were listened to on phonographs, you know, in a similar way, the CAMS are spreading out into people's houses, this time through the, through the internet. <clears throat> so one of the things that I get asked a lot now, we're sliding into sort of behind the scenes stuff, is you know, as soon as the cams got popular, my phone started ringing, oh, I've got a bird nest. How do you, how do you put up one of those cams? <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to start out with the essential components of a successful bird cam. Uh, you need birds, you need bandwidth, you need cameras, and then you need a website. And I'm going to touch on, on most of these uh, over the next few things. 
But just getting to the birds with the technology, with the bandwidth, with the cameras, even if you got it all in your pocket, is a very difficult thing. This is our, our arborist, uh, Keith Vanderhive with Limwalker Tree Care, which is a, a tree care business here in Ithaca. But he, uh, for two years, has done pro bono work climbing that tree to help us out. So he's up in the heron nest right now, strapped to the tree, um, and you'll see a little clip from this video later on in the talk. Um, so, first of all, we have several challenges. We've got nest sites that are just physically difficult to reach. They require either specialized equipment, specialized people, or both. There's no power or internet that we can use where those nests are. We have to bring it there somehow. And that's, a, that's the conduit there on the, that's a, the conduit that's out going out under the pond. This is as we were threading the, the cable through the, pond, the conduit for that. We have to get all this stuff up before the birds actually come back to breed which also means the birds might not come back to breed, um, which means you put up a camera on a nice empty nest. And um, we can't access those cameras once they're up there if the birds are breeding. We can't take a chance on scaring them away. We can't take a chance on negatively, you know, for, for a conservation organization, that's, that's pretty high up there on the list of things to do. Don't mess up the birds. Um, so already those are sort of like physical challenges almost for the most part. How do you find equipment that works? Then the, the systems themselves are relatively complex. You're not supposed to really be able to read these, but this is, this is more just an opportunity to see, you know, the thought that goes into what we're doing. And for us, you know, when it came to installing, we were using these security cameras that aren't built to be put in trees, necessarily. Um, one of the cool things about them is they can get their power over an Ethernet cable. So the Ethernet cables you might have in your house or your office actually have two wires in them that don't do anything. And quite a while back, people figured out you could send a lot of voltage down that to, to power something. So we only got to drag one cable out there, which is nice. Um, in some cases, we've used long distance wireless. We used that on the, uh, on the Hawk Nest last year, thanks to campus's help. And as I mentioned, we need specialized help to do a lot of this, whether it's an arborist, whether it's the trades on campus, and an 85 foot lift, which you'll see here in a second. And then moving forward, we wanted to try and do something different with the experience of watching cams online. We have been doing cams online, which you may or may not know, since 1998 through a project that we had called Nest Cams. And it was run and very passionate, there were many passionate viewers about it, but there were constraints involved in that project due to the technology at the time, especially. So we could only have 25 to 30 viewers on simultaneously. Um, and the cameras themselves could only carry uh, a lot less information, basically, the kind of cameras we were using. So you couldn't get those HD views. We really wanted to turn that on its head and try and prov provide like an immersive experience where it felt like you were there, where there's audio, where there's beautiful HD clarity, where the cameras can move to highlight different things. And then another thing you'll find on lots of cams are advertisements in the video stream, sometimes coming up repeatedly. And so we had to search out a way to do this without using advertisements, uh, ideally. Um, and just to mention, the, the figure on the left there are the, are the hawks, the figure on the right are the herons. Um, they look fairly similar, but there's a lot of thought that goes into figuring out how to get this stuff there. Um, so many of you may have seen this video already, but this is a video um, from last year's installation of the hawk camp. Uh, it lasts about four minutes, I think. Um, and it gives you a sense of all the different pieces that went into getting that first camera up. We wound up having to move to a new light post this year. We didn't have a film crew ready to do that because it was all very last second. But this will give you a sense, if you haven't seen it, what that was like. Charles Eldermeyer here from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. <laughs> We've had hundreds of thousands of people watching our bird cams, and many of you are beginning to know and recognize our special red-tailed hawk pair, Big Red and Ezra, as they start a new family together. <laughs> A lot of people have asked how we managed to get a camera so close to their nest. The actual installation was no easy thing. To start with, we didn't pick an easy location. The nest is 70 feet of a light tower, high above Cornell's campus, with no nearby plugs or internet. In order to bring you the live feed, we had to beam Wi-Fi hundreds of meters to the roof of Bradfield Hall's specially installed antennas. Making the Hawk Cam a reality wouldn't have been possible without the hard work and ingenuity of a talented team of scientists, electricians, and computer specialists. This is like extreme installation. This is Mark Dansker, a producer in the Cornell Labs Multimedia Program. 
He's wearing a helmet camera that will give you a bird's eye view from 70 feet above Cornell's athletic fields. So no surprises so far in the install? Yeah, I was really cold this morning. This is an extremely untraditional installation. Mark and the crew will be dealing with unpredictable weather, high winds, and numbing temperatures. We'll also need to be mindful of the hawks. Cornell ornithologists are ready with the radio to pull the installation team if the birds show signs of disturbance, like circling or dive bombing. Okay, so we want to be in that hole. We're going to do the installation all on that side. So they got some fresh, you can tell they're using it, got some nice fresh nesting material. Okay, so the one spot for this camera, the thing is it's a wall-mounted camera. This is the wall-mounted one. So here's what we're thinking. That's pretty much out of his way, right? You're going to get a nice shot of him coming by. Uh-huh, that's right. This is our nighttime camera. Can we go up a little bit? Most nest cams only have one camera, but with the nest being so inaccessible, we decided to install a backup camera and redundant microphones. The second camera has the added bonus of remote pan tilt zoom capability. So it's going to be half foot in. Perfect. That's perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so then. Despite Mark's assertions to just how perfect this was going to be, it turns out the overall installation took nearly three days. While getting pristine live HD footage accompanied by amazing sound was a direct result of our efforts, the real result will hopefully be connecting people to birds. As you can see, it takes a whole lot to set up these cams. I'm a member of the lab. <laughs> uh, I don't mean that jokingly either. But as I mentioned, we did have to switch the cameras this year to a whole new pole. And uh, even though uh, we had learned a lot from this. It still took nearly a week to get everything going. And then two further weeks because, because of some changes in the wireless antenna software that made it no longer work. So we went having to dig a trench then um, over to the nearest building and wire it in. And again, we could not have done this without all the people on campus and IT and facilities just dropping everything to, to help us. Because as I said, the birds aren't going to wait. Um, and it was only two days after we finished the installation that they laid their first egg. That gives you a real sense of, of what we're up against and also just the uncertainty in doing this. We could spend quite a bit to get this up and running if they chose a new nest and then if they decided to go someplace else at the end. You got a really nice view of campus, you know? Um, so the other thing is I had hoped to actually show you some new footage from some maintenance on the Heron camp. Uh, because typically this is the window that I would have been doing it this month. Unfortunately, Keith injured his knee at one point, so we're still in a holding pattern for getting back up the tree. But I have some footage from last year that I'm pretty sure that nobody's ever seen that uh, just gives you a sense of what that's like as well, since it's very different. There's no machinery at all. There's two people and a bunch of rope. So um, check this out. We'll start out with uh, what it's like to actually be, sorry, what it's like to actually be out on the water. This is right here. So yeah, this is out on Sap Circle Woods Pond. I've got a little GoPro camera stuck to the side of the, the rowboat there. Um, sped up a little bit just so you don't have to sit there and 
and, and it's muted, there's no sound, you, so you don't hear me huffing and puffing. <laughs> but it's, it's a really amazing thing to be out on the pond looking back, as well as to see this tree in all its like three-dimensional glory. Because we're so used to seeing it in that portrait where it just looks like a, you know, a dendritic pattern of branches, but you get underneath it, as you'll see in this next shot, um, the one that I was entering with, and it's a much more complex, interesting thing. And if you've never seen somebody climb a tree like this, I thought I'd include a quick, uh, short little blip here of Keith um, making his way up the tree. Oops, sorry. The button on here is just really small. So he's using spikes. How often does he replace that rope? Uh, well, that rope that's going around the trees actually has the metal inside it. Because when you're using this, uh, when, you're, when you're up in the tree cutting things, let me turn it down just a little bit, sorry. Um, when you're up in a tree cutting things, you don't want to accidentally cut through that rope. So it's actually reinforced with, uh, with metal. And so it takes him about two and a half minutes actually to climb the 40 feet up this tree. I think I, I think I'd stop it a little early. And what he said after climbing up the tree was that it's easily the most solid dead tree he's ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure what that means uh, from a personal perspective. But, but you can see looking up, you know, so I spent most of this day actually lying down in the boat, hollering up at him, we were having conversations. Um, but the tree is actually this really interesting, beautiful, more like a flower than like this, you know, very sort of uh, two-dimensional branching pattern. Uh, than, than you would ever get from the cams, or, the, or looking at it from the, from the building. That day we were actually switching out a lens, let me strike this up, uh, to, to put a new wide angle lens on the camera. And so um, it was about 40 degrees that day, this is uh, sometime in um, late October, early November. And we have a few of these cameras here, we actually have all the cameras that are going to be uh, you're going to see on the screen today. So if you want to come up and check them out afterwards, we have the pan tilt zoom camera over on the right side of the table, the camera that I'm working on right now, just they're not the actual camera, just the same model, and then one of the little wall mount cameras over here. Um, so when he's up in the tree, he's basically just got a, we have a pulley set up, and we just send stuff back up and down, up and down, up and down, whenever you need something new. So that's just going to be me setting into that bag. So, the weather can actually be a big factor because you have to crack these cameras open to work on them. It can't be raining. If it's really cold, doing a bunch of stuff with your fingertips is also very challenging. Um, and then it goes back up the tree, and, um, and Keith's got to make it all work. I hope this video will work. There you go. And so probably the toughest part about the Heron install is that I have to explain everything to Keith and he has to translate it into action. Um, before we installed this camera um, the first time, I was up nights thinking of all the different things that I wanted to go over. And, and he has been amazing at translating instructions into action. Um, he, deserves, he deserves a lot of credit for that. So that's him putting the camera back together on that same day that I switched the lens out. So even when you have everything in place, the birds maybe haven't come back yet, but you're, but you're, you're hopeful they will. Um, you need a spot for people to come watch. And for us, that spot is on our awesome allaboutbirds.org website. Um, we benefit immensely from being a part of that. You can see us right up, maybe you can't read it, but we're the second thing over on the navigation bar. People can accidentally click on us even, which is cool. Um, and All About Birds already gets millions of visitors a year. Okay, I think we crossed 10 or 12 million uh, this year so far. And so that alone, that traffic kind of like, that is just a river going by that rock that is cams and a bunch of, you know, stuff splashes on, onto that rock all the time that is cams and we, and we really gain from that location. It's like real estate. But the other thing is that there's, people are already going there for other things. So we can surround our camera with really great content. <coughs> We can, we can sort of capitalize on the fact we have great designers and programmers working on All About Birds to make it that resource. And so we can basically cloak the camera in the mantle that All About Birds has worked so hard to already create. So it's great because um, without that content, it becomes you know just a window, which is great, a window to see something really beautiful. With that mantle, it becomes, it has the potential to become a lot more. 
And we're creating all that, so it's, a, it's something that people trust. We also had a great partnership with Livestream, uh, which is our third-party streaming provider. We don't send out this stream to everybody from this building. We basically send it to Livestream, and then Livestream has the technology to let thousands of people watch at a time, millions of people. I actually watched the New Year's Eve ball drop last year. I think there was something like 1.2 million people online at the same time as me watching in HD. So they have the technology and the know-how to scale that so that everybody can enjoy that experience. And they also allow, they also have the, uh, you have the opportunity to embed that player. So we can take that player and stick it wherever we want. So now you've got your great website, everything's up and running, you're psyched, and then, has anybody ever seen this, uh, <laughs> this slide right here? <laughs> Cam, cameras offline, please stand by. So it turns out these systems go down. No matter how many fail safes you put in place, they go down. And for us, you know, it's not uncommon for them to go down sometimes weekly. Um, so what I'd like you to do right now is just close your eyes for a second. I'm not going to show you anything pretty for, for just a couple seconds here. So close your eyes. So it's late at night, you're lying in bed, <laughs> and suddenly, there's a cam down. You wake up and the web team springs into action. Okay, we actually have people on call during the breeding season um, to deal with problems as they arise. Um, Syed, unfortunately, uh, left us to work someplace else uh, recently, and he was great at this. He, uh, he always did it with a smile and would come in the next day when he got texted at two in the morning. You know, he'd be pretty happy about it still. And then Franz and Greg are the people that have kept all the different bits and pieces of the website running. So when something breaks, they're the people that wind up ultimately fixing that, typically. Um, and I should mention, Alex pretty much figured out the initial technical workflow for how we got a lot of this stuff to work. So I'm going to walk you through it. We get that call. OK, it's not streaming. That window's up. Why is it up? Well, the camera itself could have gone bonk. Okay? And and right now, for example, the pan tilt zoom camera on the heron nest, we've just lost contact with it. Um, so there's still a couple things we might be able to try, but we might just need to replace that camera. So if we log into the camera, because they're accessible via the network, and everything's OK there, next thing, well, the machines that are doing the encoders, what you're looking at there is where the magic happens. And it doesn't really look like much, does it? <laughs> it's like somebody's messy office. But those two computers are actually encoding the streams that are coming from the cameras. So the camera sends a stream to the computer. The computer takes that stream, packages it up, and sends it to live stream. So at either of those spots, something might have gone wrong. So we can log into those computers remotely. I can do it from my phone. I can fix things from my phone if I have data coverage. And I've been known to pull over the car while we're driving someplace. Like, oh, there's a cam down. You know, log in, fix it, keep going. Um, every once in a while, live stream can have an outage. And when that happens, typically all of our cams go down. And that's pretty easy to diagnose. But in each stage of this, it requires some level of diagnosis. And that can be hard at 2 in the morning, um, which is why we generally only focus on really high traffic times to really have that level of response. Um, and then lastly, everybody's happy watching their computer. Uh, this is a great picture of uh, someone's dog on Facebook that um, really loves the feeder cam that's up right now. In the garden. Um, and I just, it's so cute, you know? Um, so the only thing I haven't really mentioned in this workflow, I say we have an on-call crew uh, that can swoop in at a moment's notice, um, is how we actually get that call. And I'll give you a hint. We talked about this earlier. You all mentioned, pretty much all of you mentioned reading or participating in chat. Um, the moderators. Our team of moderators. And I'm going to share a little bit about the moderators with you uh, in general, not personal details on the moderators. Um, <laughs> But just to give you a sense of, of what we're up to with them and what, and what they're up to, um, that's just a little screen cap of uh, chat during Hatch the first year at the Hawk's Nest. I think there were something like 9,000 simultaneous viewers online. Okay? And there were probably four or five moderators at that point in the chat. Um, I use something, use something called that I like to think of as the communicator model of, of letting chat develop, and we really focus on moderators as communicators 
not necessarily as experts. So the first thing we want a, a moderator to be able to do is to be able to communicate. And to do that online is actually very hard. All you have are words typed into a computer. It's a very disembodying way to interact with someone, or it can be. So the challenge is to create this friendly, welcoming place that's engaging enough for people to stick around, but accurate enough as well for them to feel like they're learning. And it's much, I think it's much more difficult to teach someone to be a good communicator than to teach them facts about what they're watching. And furthermore, um, we really like them to encourage what I like to call the democratization of discovery. That is, you don't have to be working at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to discover something. And one of the early, in one of the early orientations last year, you know, well, what do I do if I don't know a question? Well, we're all here to watch, learn, and share. And most of the questions that get asked, all you have to do is to, is, is to watch to find out that answer. It's basically encouraging people to do the process of science without telling them they're doing science. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Victoria over here uh, is our communications specialist. And she is basically hands-on with the moderators 24-7. It's her phone that rings when something goes wrong or somebody's got a question, which this year has been great, and I love the moderators, but it really takes a full-time position devoted mostly to keeping the chaos that is live chat a really positive chaos for everyone involved, for both moderators and viewers and chatters alike. And that's a challenging place to be in, and Victoria's done a great job at that this year, as well as juggling the fact we need to orient volunteers, train, we meet with them uh, multiple times throughout the, uh, throughout the breeding season on teleconference calls, and um, she also does work on archiving and social media. So it's a very full position, it takes a lot, but just like any position, if you've ever worked in a position where you're dealing with people, working to resolve things with people or provide resources to people, very labor intensive. And so a big thanks uh, to Victoria for coming on board. Um, and now sort of a fun, what I think of as fun stuff about the moderators. Uh, just this year alone, um, they probably gave at least 60,000 hours of person time moderating the chat rooms. That adds up to over, like almost seven years. And that's sort of my back of the envelope calculation um, based upon some averages, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually quite, quite a bit higher. That includes thousands of tweets that they've, that they've posted and updates to the, to the, so each nest has its own Twitter account where you can follow what's happening at the nest. The moderators are the ones that update those. And then likely millions, or if we add up over both years, tens of millions of communications conveyed in real time. Those are answering questions, but they're also creating that friendly atmosphere, saying hello, you know. Um, that is unbelievable to me. That you can that this is the amount of time people are spending. We have a crew of, you know, 35 to 40 moderators, um, and such is their motivation and drive to be this um, facilitator in that conversation that it's it's just an impressive amount of time. The other cool thing is they're actually spread across the world. Lots of people don't realize this, but the moderators are not here in Ithaca. Very few of them are. I think we've had one. A couple other that come from relatively near Ithaca, and then from all across the country. In fact, Canada, Sweden, UK. So this is truly, we have people across the world now helping to drive that chat. And it's, it's partially, I think, that diversity of personalities when interpreted through that communicator model that helps drive the engaging part of the chat as well. If it was just me chatting there, I guarantee you know, chat will go down over time. So it's also helpful to have moderators whose time zones are not 6 a.m. when it's 6 a.m. here, if you know what I mean. So we have, we have a, a, the European moderators are great for that. So ultimately, you know, with all the technology and people in place, it's really the birds, though, that drive the viewership. And um, the next few slides are, for the most part, going to be some of my highlights. But um, in this shot that you're going to see, some of you may have seen this, you know, we had left the camera, this is from the first year, prior to them starting the nest, we had left the camera stationed on the branch, on this branch, because I had seen them land on that branch in the past. And I never would have guessed what it, what it caused. So, um, you know, the hawks were already broadcasting. This was a couple weeks after the hawks. And everybody was falling in love with them, and I mean, I love them dearly. Uh, but I have to confess, for me, this is the clip that really grabbed my imagination. So, um, without further ado.
All of a sudden, I was I was up there in that nest, and uh, I felt like it was the you know the Jurassic practically. It looked like I was that could have been a Jurassic swamp somewhere, and this could have been some prehistoric bird. It really just bang, and and along with that came the realization that holy cow, you know, again going back to the start, I've seen great blue herons my whole life. You know, like great blue herons, like uh, you know. All of a sudden, I realized I'm going to learn so much about, about great blue herons from watching this camera. And um, if that's not an exciting feeling, you know, I don't know what is. So there we were, watching and learning together. And it's hard to see in this particular image, but what you're watching is it's roughly, I think, 11 p.m. maybe right now. And those are the herons copulating in the middle of the night. So they're uh, breeding, uh, making new herons. Um, all sorts of euphemisms out there, but it's called copulating. And uh, little or no, so people know that herons are active, active at night. There's really little or no documentation that this was happening um, in the middle of the night. And so, um, you know, we were constantly amazed at what we were seeing. And the neat thing, I don't know if you can see this, but right here, I don't know if you can read that in the back, but it says, Lab Director JWF. That's Fitz, our, our, the director of the lab, John Fitzpatrick, in the chat with a bunch of chatters. And his first comment is, wow, how delicate is that? <laughs> like a seasoned, you know, social, you know, chatter guy. You know, he's saying how delicate is that because he just watched that male heron step up onto the back of the female heron. Okay? Further down, all caps. You might be able to see this one back. I am pretty sure that's the first time this has ever been documented. Okay? This is a guy who's won awards for being an ornithologist, a guy who's, like, got birds named after him in Peru. Okay? Who's excited, right? And if you look all around them, they're excited. We're all excited together. And so, um, you know, the equal access to this kind of experience is something I don't think the world's ever experienced. You know, the ability for anybody, no matter where you are, to peek in on something real and live, unscripted, is unheard of. And the other thing is what's happening is interesting. It's interesting whether you're a beginner or you're an expert. And we're there on that frenzy and excitement of riding the same wave of discovery together, you know? And um, that's the really exciting thing about it to me. Another example of this kind of discovery uh, and, and, the, and the role that the public can play in it is um, it's going to be a clip. I'll, just, I'll, I'll ruin it for you now. A great horned owl attacking the great blue heron last year in the middle of the night. So even though this looks full color, it looks pretty grainy on your up there, but it's full color because the camera that we're using can actually see in full color on starry nights. So um, despite the time of day, this is like I think three in the morning if I remember correctly, people were watching. <laughs> they were watching this bird sleep. And <laughs> don't judge, right? <laughs> And I think the first person that sensed so we found out about this because people were watching. But more even so, because people were listening. There's a beautiful soundtrack to the night in Sapsucker Woods. And people would put this on and literally fall asleep to it. And you can, you'll see why um, that wouldn't work so well. Oh, sorry. You want to see that one? Hold on. So we can talk about the beauty of these birds, we can talk about the, how cute the, the fledglings are, but at their heart, these birds are creatures with an enormous will to live. And 
I don't know about you if you're a betting person, but if you just said, who's going to win? Great horned owl in the middle of the night or a great blue heron sleeping on a nest? Yeah, I probably would put money on that great, great horned owl. But what a response from that female. You can't, you can just barely see it now. She used to have two neutral plumes <laughs> nearly, uh, you know, over a foot, foot and a half long coming off her head. They're not there anymore. They were torn off her head by that owl. So these cameras also give us an almost terrifying vision of what it must be like to live as one of these birds. You know, we don't have to face that, but other things that scare us in our lives that you can't predict. Sure. And again, that's something that drives attachment. People start to realize these birds deal with the same things we deal with. You know, we can't view them as people, but we can view their experiences through our eyes. And the cool thing, again, about this, uh, the less terrifying thing, is you know, time and time again, whether it was through screenshots or tweets or emails or in chat, the, the crowdsourced nature of this information you know, meant that literally no stone was left unturned. You know, everything that was happening at that nest was most likely noted, which is, again, that's not the way science is done. You know, one scientist can't sit there and watch a nest for 24 hours. Even though they were attacked a number of times more that year, the still rains is one of my favorite pictures. I can remember taking this screenshot um, while I was watching. This was about 7.15 in, in the evening um, as these two little fluffy, you know, bobbly-headed uh, youngsters were standing there as a third one was hatching out. And even in this, we saw behaviors that aren't mentioned about the adult helping, removing part of the cat straight away. Okay, this wasn't a behavior that had ever been seen. Um, so there's discovery just waiting. We just have to watch. <coughs> now I've been talking about the herons a lot. Some of the uh, some of the most poignant things I feel like that have happened at the heron or at the hawk nest I actually feel like happened this year. We had some amazing uh, interactions seen on camera between the hawks, um, and in this particular clip, um, it seemed especially poignant. So it's going to start. The bird with the back to us is Big Red, the female. And you can just see the head that you can see is actually Ezra. He's facing the camera, um, backing off the nest. They're doing a switch um, in the middle of a rainstorm. And, uh, you know, he's now given the chance to go seek some shelter or forage. He's probably been sitting there an hour and a half, possibly two. And, um, you know, let's see what he does. So you can hear the rain there. She's actually balling up her talons right there so she doesn't hurt the, the egg or the, or the young. It's young at this point. So it's downy young underneath her. I mean, it's, it's so hard not to anthropomorphize, right? And, and, uh, you know, but it, it's, it's something that anyone who's ever cared for somebody, and anyone who's ever been in the rain, I mean, can relate to that. And the knowledge there are three downy young under there. I think it was about 40 degrees that day. Um, this is in that big spate of rain that we had in sort of um, like mid-April, I think, late April. Um, it's just a powerful resolve to overcome. They don't have that resolve. That's the way I'm interpreting it. But, it's, but there is a drive in animals to reproduce and be successful. That's what we're seeing. But we're seeing it in all the intimacy that can be brought through these cameras. To me, it's also interesting uh, with the red tails, the tenderness with which they can provision their young. You think of them as these speedy, deadly, predators, at least I do, you know, you see them soaring on the wing, diving after things, but then, you know, in a moment,
<laughs> and so, um, yeah, they're just so amazing that they can, it's feeding pigeon there, by the way. Um, and, and that's another actually interesting story from this year that I'll just mention very briefly. Uh, last year, a whole lot of chipmunks were fed. Uh, it seemed to be a really good chipmunk year. And this year, no snakes were brought to the nest last year. This year, if you do a quick analysis of what prey items were tweeted on the Cornell, Hacks Twitter, Cornell Hawks Twitter feed, um, there's something like 49 mentions of snakes this year. Um, they became this item that totally wasn't available, at least last year, it seems like. So, and the first people to notice that were the moderators and the viewers. It wasn't the ivory tower scientists. Um, what kind of snakes were they? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I know that a few of them were identified, but I don't know that they even were all identified. So um, it's a great question, and it'll get toward hopefully a question I can answer at the end, which involves some of the future plans for how we hope to use this footage to learn more about things. Um, then you can contrast that, that delicate, dainty foraging with uh, the raucous <laughs> clacking of the heron nest. Um, uh, I'll just play it. Sorry, here. They can bring us to laughter, like that clip. I've never shown that to an audience that didn't wind up laughing. <laughs> especially if there are any parents out there. You've been there, right? Like, just sit down. Um, but that's also tempered with the fact they can also bring us concern, like with the uh, attack by the owls. Those days following that were filled with a lot of concern. You could see that in the chat. Um, and in this year's loss of two young hawks on campus, likely from this pair. Um, one found injured on campus, the other found dead. And uh, from traumatic injuries. Um, and this is something that as a community though, um, there's been an amazing amount of communication and resilience around these events. Whether it is the joy that's communicated and shared, whether it's the concern, whether it's the sorrow, um, and really, this uh, group of people whom you all are part of, who watch these cameras and have identified with these birds, have created this community probably unlike anything that's ever existed before in, in time. Um, centered on these real unscripted experiences, you're all spread out through space and time, watching and experiencing the same thing. And as part of this community, it's been fun to actually watch it develop. So these are a couple of word clouds from the, uh, from the Twitter feeds, actually. And it shows that the bigger the word is, the more often it was mentioned, the smaller the word. And you know, together, as a community, we learned both the, you know, the um, accurate scientific vocabulary that, that underlies our understanding of these animals, but also came up with our own vocabulary to describe things and use as a group. And it was a very organic process. The one, you can't really see it probably too well. It's right herps. here. Um, it's, the word herps is one of my favorites because it refers to when an adult heron comes back to the nest and feeds the young, as you saw in that last movie. They herp up a bunch of fish. You know, if you're limited to 140 characters or 160 characters, regurgitate is a long one. It's also a long one to type out in chat. Um, Earp became the nomenclature very early on, and it was completely community driven. Um, there's lots of things like that. And if there's anything I can say, chat can sometimes, to a newcomer, 
seem like there's a confusing swirl of jargon maybe that gets, you might come in during a period where words that you don't know like herb are being used. You might come in where a word that you don't know like hallux, which is a part of a, which is the rear toe on a, on a bird, you know, the hawk, the big town in the back. The reason that chat is there is not so you can be intimidated by that language, but to dive in and start talking, asking, learning. So I hope that everyone realizes that, like with any social construct, there will be all sorts of things that swirl around and are driven within that construct that a newcomer wouldn't necessarily know right off the bat. But I encourage you, if you enjoy communicating with people online, to dive in and just get your feet wet. And the cool thing is, too, you know, in addition to this language, there's just an enormous amount of creativity in the community. And, uh, and this ranges from artwork, poetry, people posting videos, people actually sitting there taking, recording what's happening on their screen so they can, at a moment's notice, post that on YouTube so people can see it much faster than we can do here. Um, in part because you know, we have students making, um, sending in art and making art. You know, people watched at home, left chores undone, tuned in at work to reduce stress. Uh, but ultimately they found some kind of solace, interest, engagement in these birds. Um, and on top of that, the volunteer moderators are keeping the chat going 18 hours a day, every day, during this period. Um, the, camps, the camps community also found support in one another, as I've mentioned, and um, this is about a two minute long slideshow that displays some of the feedback that we've gotten about the camps. Oh, sorry. It's just cool. They make the little button down here so small. Let's see here, gotta go to the next one. Try one more time. Sorry. They put the little play button right next to all the other buttons. Sorry about the play bar on the bottom. This is truly awesome and addictive. <laughs> Thing that's incredible to me is all this feedback is completely unsolicited. There is a comment box where people can tell us things. And we received more comments than ever before based around these CAMs. Another really interesting thing about this is that this CAMs community that we've been talking about, that you're a part of, um, both the hawks and herons, they're actually different separate communities of people that are more focused on hawks or more focused on the herons. Each of its own accord, in a self-governed -govern way over the last couple of years, have had gatherings here where people have come from across the country to meet the people that they've been communicating with online, come here in, in place and time to see the nests. Um, in some cases, have planned entire weekends with activities all around the Finger Lakes, uh, within Sapsucker Woods doing a, uh, you know, a simultaneous one-hour observation at multiple points within Sapsucker Woods where at every station someone's taking notes, taking pictures, doing art. Um, motivated people. And so it's, it's a really beautiful thing to kind of think about it as being this circle where uh, we're all doing this online, we're meeting each other online, and at the same time, there's the opportunity for that to turn into a connection in real life as well. Because um, it starts with these shared experiences. 
and then it's really neat that we can come together and share each other. So we're just about finished up here. Um, I get a lot of questions about what's next. Um, right now, the theater watch cams, if you haven't seen them, are really popular. Uh, we have one here in Sapsucker Woods, which is the one on the left. Um, all the feeders and stuff are provided by Wild Birds Unlimited here, the store in the building, which is really great. Um, the feeder on the right is actually up in Ontario. And not Ontario, like up just over there by Niagara Falls, but all the way west. If you go off the northern point of Lake Superior, a good hour or two, a place called Manitowoc. It's a great place to see evening gross beaks. I've actually seen more evening gross beaks on this cam than I've ever seen in my life. And it's just, it's a real blessing. You can hear them singing in the background, well, calling in the background. So I leave that on often and listen to it at work. I'm still hoping to fit in heron maintenance, this heron cam maintenance, this fall and actually make some modifications that will hopefully keep the cameras cleaner this coming year. Um, Got a lot of suggestions, thank you very much uh, for both the uh, pleasant tone and uh, um, and we do have some new nest cams planned for 2014 and I'm not going to quite let the cat out of the bag but if everything goes well we may have another three cams coming online in 2014. Some of them during our breeding season, some of them a little bit before and some of them um, right about as our season ends. So um, with that, um, I'd like to just, again, take a moment to acknowledge when Miyoko talked about what I did with this project, that there are a ton of people that actually make this successful and really couldn't do it without any of them. People on the web team, Alex, Fran, Syed, Greg, Hugh, Sarah, Jesse, Scott, Victoria. Um, communications, our communications department is great. Great visuals in both print and online. Um, the Nest Camps project that came before us that we were able to learn from um, and basically make this jump. Um, our multimedia team has been great helping us out with creating highlights and, and produce pieces like that film you saw at the start. The IT group in the building here has been instrumental in allowing our moderators to have access to the network so they can actually drive the cams for everybody. And then the facilities po folks here in the building who have actually helped you know, get some of this work done on site um, has been a huge help. Uh, Cornell's facility services helped uh, immensely on campus, couldn't do without them. And of course, Lynn Walker Tree Care um, here at the tree. So with that, I'll open it to questions. Um, lots of ways to stay in touch, so please do, um, whether you're in the room or online. And um, hopefully we'll just keep on bringing you fun, engaging cams. And um, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks. Saw your hand go up first. Uh, has anyone suggested that the nuptial feathers evolve so that, that you know they would take the predator's attack? Like the people who study. Uh, yeah, it's an yeah, it's an interesting thought. Right, were you going to say the people who study like uh, weasels or something like bird, that? No, bird colonies. Oh, okay. Like the gull colonies, the breeding gulls. They wear the hard hats with feathers. Oh, great. Up. Right. Yeah. So the question is, um, is it possible that those neutral plumes might have evolved even as a as a way for you know a predator to potentially be grabbing that instead of your head, um, which is actually a, a common thing sometimes in like lizards or rodents, you know, where uh, the little black tip at the end of an ermine's tail as it runs across the, the, the snow is the thing that supposedly a hawk might cue in on and try and grab rather than the body. I wouldn't say there's any evidence for it. Um, they, you know, they grow them only well, pretty much. Look, you have a little bit of evidence. Yeah. <laughs> well, they grow them during the breeding season. Who knows? It, it may, may have some. That, that particular um, female was actually kind of interesting because one of hers was black and one of them was white. Typically, they're both black. Um, so in that case, it may have even, you know, maybe it was the brightest thing the hawk, the, the, the owl saw. Um, I also wonder if the camera actually helped her survive um, because that owl came swooping up and she literally like kind of rolled towards the camera. And I just wonder if the camera hadn't been there, she's just gone off the side. Kind of interesting to think about. Not that we're trying to affect things, but <laughs> root for the home team, right? Um, anyone else? Yes? Uh, the tree. Yes. <laughs> I know that it's standing solid now. Are there any other trees similar to that around close by that if that tree goes, that the errands might be able to build another, would build another one? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is whether or not, you know, if that tree were to fall, is it, is it possible that the herons might stick around? And already we're dealing kind of with, um, you know, a slightly odd heron 
in that herons are typically colonial animals, or colonial birds, they're animals too, but they typically live in colonies. And so for some reason, this individual chose not to. The male is the only one we know for sure that has been here every year. Um, so we're dealing with someone that's already got sort of a skewed set of uh, <laughs> desires relative to the norm, anyway. But it's a, it's a known thing. They do, there are individuals that consistently will go nest without a colony. Um, in the second year here that we had a nest, um, there was a second pair that came and nested basically in the next tree over. Um, they built a fairly small nest, had laid two eggs, and they were successful. I don't think the nest could have held anything more than two because it was sort of right, the, the tree itself wasn't very big. So there's a number of dead swamp oaks in that area from when that pond was, when that area was originally flooded, um, you know, 60 years ago. Um, but it would just come down to the desire of that heron to stick around. Um, you know, that tree's been dead since the mid 60s. So um, certainly within the realm of reason because there's already been another nest on site. But um, it was fun watching them actually take every single stick out of that nest and add it to their own. Um, <laughs> I can't remember if that was last year or this year they run together, but you know, one day I looked up and was like, oh, all the sticks were leaving. And you can see the heron, male heron taking them back. <laughs> yes? Are you interested in doing a turkey vulture? Um, you know, turkey vulture, uh, I wouldn't say no, we're not interested, but right now, you know, the, the honest truth is to even have two of these cams up and running at the same time, um, even though I show that big team of people on that last slide, there's only like one and a half people focused on this full time, depending on how you want to count Victoria's time, because she only works for us half the year. Um, so we really don't have the... The reason I mention it is because this one you can walk right up to the nest. Yes, yeah, so we are focusing on some other species that we can walk right up to the nest, but again, I'm not going <coughs> to let the cat out of the bag quite yet in case they don't come back. What's the cost of a camera? Um, you know, these cameras up here, so the, co the question was, what's the cost of the camera? Um, you know, a little one, a little one like this, which is an HD camera, um, but it's a fixed camera, it doesn't move around at all, it does really well in low light, but it's just sort of, you point it somewhere, that's what it's going to look at. It has a little bit of ability to zoom in and out, um, and then you kind of, if you, if you don't use all of its resolution, you can sort of digitally pan and zoom around. This costs about $1,000. Um, it's made, all of our cameras are made by Axis Communications. Um, they work really well in the workflow that we've designed to get the signal online. Because these aren't, security cameras aren't by nature designed to be broadcast through a third party streaming unit like Livestream. They like real cameras um, that have a really consistent signal. So part of the reason our streams go down is because we're using these network cameras. They're a piece of software that's sensitive to the fluctuations of data that you get by sending something across the internet. Um, and nowhere is that more evident than Ontario, where the feeder watch cam is, where that entire town beams a signal over satellite. And so whenever it's windy, we lose a lot of data and it crashes the encoder. Oh, sorry, I was going to go through Sorry. One second. This middle one, which is also a fixed cam, like the one on the hawk's nest, or sorry, the heron nest, is probably like $1,300. And um, this bigger pan tilt zoom camera that's um, up on the heron nest. And this is actually the one that was on the first hawk nest. I was just up there about a month and a half ago taking this down. Um, this costs more like $3,000 probably. Mm -hmm. So, guy behind you first, sorry. Oh, are, is there a permanent record of this stuff? Or is it just so we've archived everything at this point. It's all sitting on hard drives. And I'm glad you asked that question because you asked a good question earlier. Um, so the hope is we're going we're gonna to be, we're, we're looking for, um, what we'd like to do is explore the idea of crowdsourcing in the same way that we're doing it in real time, crowdsourcing these archives where the, the data is almost embedded somehow. We're not sure the technology exists right now, but the idea would be to combine the interest and passion of people with an opportunity to record data that's in there because it's just a very time consuming thing to do. And so it's, it's something we're definitely um, interested in. We're probably going to be trying to at least get a student working on it. Um, hopefully in the next uh, year. Um, go ahead. How much communication between uh, the, the Osprey nest out west and you talking to each other and learning things from each other? Yeah, so the question was, how much communication between us and, like, for example, the Osprey, the Osprey nest out west? So we also, as, as, some, as you know, we feature other cameras on our website. Um, we have a couple 
Osprey cameras in Montana. We had an American Kestrel box in Idaho. Um, our first year we even had a, a Bluebird box from here in New York. Um, each of those are partnerships that we build with the people. So in, in each of those cases, they have all their own equipment. And what, what we do is we figure out, um, you know, basically what they need to, what they're looking to get out of partnering with us. And we sort of design a partnership where it, uh, they're shown on our website and basically get a lot more viewers pointed at them. But we're very good friends with people like the guy that actually runs the camera at the University of Montana, the Hellgate Cam. Mm -hmm. He's actually one of my advisors in grad school at the University of Montana, Eric Green. He's great. So we talk to them very frequently, actually. We just collaborated with them on a talk at the Montana Society for Conservation Biology that was all about the, the, the Osprey Cam effort. <coughs> so yeah, go ahead, Simon. So who controls the time of the Zoom? Uh, the moderators do. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing about these cameras being networked is um, you can basically give people the ability to log in to them and drive them around. Um, yeah. Yes. Where were the Hawks banded? The Hawks were both banded here in Ithaca. So um, John Parks, who runs the Cornell Raptor program on campus, uh, both of the hawks, I believe, were banded as part of an animal science class that was caught, taught, um, you know, about uh, six to ten years ago. Um, one was caught over a game farm, or no, one was caught, Ezra was caught over around Judd Falls, and Big Red was actually caught out in Brookendale, according to the record. Um, Big Red was caught as a first-year bird, so she was caught in the first fall of her Yes, yes, they were both flying. So we know we actually know how old Big Red is. We don't know how old Ezra is. We can just assign a minimum age because at the point of when he was caught, his feathers told us that he was at least three years old, which is kind of a fun, fun fact. Yes. Biologically speaking, what have what big things have you learned uh, from watching the, the, the hawks and the herons? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, both of them are really well-studied creatures because they're common. Um, some of the, most of the things that we're discovering are relatively small things. So, for example, the copulation in the middle of the night never been documented. Um, that sound that the heron made when it was attacked never been documented. It does not exist in our Macaulay Library of sounds that has over, you know, 150,000 clips of sound. Um, so it's, it's more on the scale of those kinds of discoveries that we're typically making, um, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes on a monthly basis. And, and the way that I think about it is we really have, we're watching you know, two pairs of individuals. Um, of, and, and there's you know, potentially millions of those individuals out there in the wild. Um, so what we can learn is at a scale, a finer grain scale often than what um, we've been able to know previously because we can watch them 24 seven. But its application to red-tailed hawks writ large is much harder to judge because it's one data point when you're describing, you know what I mean? But um, it's a good, great question. Yes, Sean? A couple of questions from the chatters. Great. Uh, who say, great presentation and love being part of this too. Oh, thank you. Very and for everybody in the audience, we had about 650 people online during most of this watching the talk. Chatting away as they normally do too. <laughs> Charles, can you uh, uh, describe a little bit more about how the um, pan tilt zoom works for people and the moderators? They're all curious and asking about that a little more in depth. And part two, if you don't mind me asking, can you talk a little bit more about D1 and D3 in specific detail? What happened? Sure. Yeah. You. Let me um, let me just bring up my browser here. Uh, so uh, so let's talk about. Um, the cameras. So the cameras are all networked and they're actually behind the campus's firewall. So in order to get to even log into them, you have to be on campus or have access to our VPN, which is Virtual Private Network. And that's where our IT group was really instrumental in getting access to all these moderators by them basically getting guest IDs on the Cornell system. Um, so I can't actually see what I'm doing here. So essentially you log into the camera I don't know if it would make sense to um, maybe just lower the lights slightly, but this is this is basically the view that um, people can see when they're driving. It's the view that you see 
but there's uh, actually a crosshair in the middle which you can't quite make out because it's a little bright. And what I can do is basically, one thing I can do is I can click on the screen and it'll, the camera will move to focus on that. Um, it's going to be moving kind of slowly because I'm on wireless right now. I can zoom in by drawing a box if I want to and it'll zoom into that spot really fast. Um, you can also use these sliders down here so I can, I can back it out a little bit, back it out all the way. I can click sort of halfway down. So this is the interface that our, um, our moderators are using to actually drive the camera. There are some other technologies out there that use less bandwidth. So basically this is a whole other stream of information coming out of the camera. So in places where there's not much bandwidth, which thankfully we don't have to deal with on campus here, there might be some lower bandwidth ways for us to still allow people to drive the camera. And we might be trying that out on the Nest um, this winter if everything goes well. So that's the question about um, cams. And as far as uh, the two hawks, um, the two young hawks that were found injured and or dead on campus, um, I'm not sure which details they might be interested in, but if, if you haven't heard the whole story, I can tell it to you in brief. Um, on a morning in August, around the start of August, I believe, I can't remember the date exactly, it might have been late July, um, one young hawk, a juvenile hawk, was found dead on the ground over by um, Bradfield Hall, and another was found severely injured um, near the intersection of Judd Falls and 366. And um, since we don't ban the young, we have no way to know 100% for sure that they came from this nest. But on that same day, we had there's a great community of what they call birders on the ground that once the once the hawks have fledged, actually follow the family around campus. Sometimes even live streaming from their own um, phone or camera hooked up to their phone for data. And um, that day that those two young showed up injured and dead, they were only finding one still living. Um, juvenile with the adults hanging out on campus. So despite, you know, really heroic efforts by um, the vet school to save the, the injured hawk, ultimately its, its legs were too injured to really allow it to ever stand up again and its quality of life was, was going to be terrible and so it was euthanized. Um, and there was a huge outpouring of um, support from the camps community for that decision. You know, it kind of makes me feel a little choked up even now talking about it. Um, one thing I don't know that everybody knows online even is that we, um, there is somebody on campus that is working on um, building a DNA microsatellite library for red-tailed hawks, and we have tissues from the two young ones um, still, so we can genotype them. We can basically look and do paternity testing. So the only thing we need now is um, basically some genetic material from Big Red and Ezra, and we'll actually be able to tell whether or not those two young came from, uh, came from Big Red and Ezra and sort of know for sure. Any, any thoughts on what um, Yeah, so the first one, the first one, uh, the one that was found dead, mm -hmm. definitely died from traumatic impact related injuries. Um, again, it's hard to know what might have happened. It could have run into a building, a window, a car, but there weren't a lot of broken bones, which doesn't suggest mm -hmm. that, and I, I don't want to speculate too heavily, that that's what the uh, autopsy or the necropsy report said. Um, the other one is a little bit more puzzling because its legs were just really injured. And, uh, and it's hard to imagine exactly how that might have happened. Um, the vets weren't, didn't have a clear idea about why that would have happened either. So um, one thing we did do proactively though is we met with Cornell facilities to talk about the possibility that it could have been a mechanical injury in nature. Maybe the bird had gotten its legs stuck somewhere. And they were um, very... Uh, you know, interested in working with us to identify any hazards that we thought might be of concern and to figure out whether or not there could be things done to make sure that they weren't impacting the hawks. So they've been, you know, really great to work with. Um, yes? Another question that we hear a lot, Charles, and they're asking again tonight is, uh, why don't we ban these birds that we're watching so closely? Yeah, no, it's a great question because banding, uh, number one, it allows us to continue this relationship with a sense of Sureness, you know, if everyone's kids look the same and you sent your kids off to college, you'd be like, I don't know which one's mine. You know, which, one's, which one's getting the A grades, right? Um, but the thing to remember about banding is that every time you interact with an animal, there's a chance for something bad to happen. And you want to make sure that if I'm going to go out there and grab a bird, that we're doing it for a really good reason. And just sort of satisfying our knowledge of who is who isn't, doesn't really meet that standard. 
Um, if these birds were part of a scientific study, let's say, and there was going to be some outcome, some measurable outcome that we needed to put a band on a bird to determine, you know, that then starts to become a reasonable, a reasonable reason to, to really want to put a band on a bird. But, you know, the way I look at it is, um, A, I feel we're just really lucky to be able to look at the birds, period. And um, until we have sort of a really strong rationale for interacting with them even more than we already have, um, you know, we, we want to stay as hands-off as, as we can. I don't know if you have anything you'd want to add to that, Mioko. Okay. okay. Yes? You talked about sort of the moderated chat rooms of self-governors. Do the moderators like sign up for shifts? Or yeah, what? so... We're all wanting to tilt the camera at the same No, no, it's a great question. So when I said self-governed, I was, I was thinking more of the community that, that formed around these camps. So there's, there's groups on Facebook, there's listservs, there's, um, you know, you name it. So that's what I was. That's more what I was talking about when I said self-governed, in that those just sprung organically without really any direction from us. The moderation is actually, you could ask Victoria about this, but the, the moderation is actually a much more complex beast. So we do have shifts that people sign up for. In case I didn't mention, the question was, um, sort of how do how do we how do we uh, schedule manage the, the moderators? So um, there are shifts they sign up for. They um, they go through a sort of a teleconference orientation with us at the start where we really talk a lot about, we talk with them to learn more about them, as well as talking really with what we're hoping to achieve through the chat. And um, we're up, we have multiple teleconferences during the year to kind of touch base, see how people are doing. We have our own sort of private group where we're sharing resources with them that they can share in chat or they can ask us questions um, and get a response that everybody in the group can see. So it's more, it's more formalized there, for sure. And it wouldn't work without that. So in terms of the CAM operation, only one person is supposed to be on at a time, and they, they basically sign up for that under most of the situations. Are you keeping a collection of the, I guess, the, for want of a better word, the best of the of the camp thing? Because yeah, I mean, the one with the the parent chicks is great. Uh, my favorite is the the stupid starling. Yeah, so <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> You told me we didn't have a starling camp. Um, <laughs> no one's like, oh, the poor starling. Um, so he's, he's referencing, the question was uh, whether or not we, we're saving these highlights, whether we have a best of the best kind of thing. And we do post a lot of them to YouTube. So typically, like, our best of the best, we're posting to YouTube. Um, and our, our YouTube address is just youtube.com slash lab ornithology. Um, if you just search for lab ornithology, you'll find it. So the starling one, for example, is on there. Those, those herons are on there. I should log out of the camera. <laughs> um, the, the starlings are on, the starling one's on there. So we have most of them on YouTube because um, then people can share them. So, you know, if you wanted to share it with a friend, you can say, this is an awesome clip. So the clip he's talking about, um, there's one hawk nestling still in the nest, very close to fledging. And um, this whole time during the entire breeding season, there's a little hole in the pole where there's a starling nest in there. You can hear them when the starlings are going in and out throughout the year. It's always something that the young hawks are watching the starlings flying around all the time. You can almost imagine them salivating because it's all instinctual because They've never flown, they've never killed anything before, you know, as prey. And with one left in the nest, uh, just kind of hanging back, uh, one of the starlings fledged. And you can see it poking its head out of the hole and the adult had this big, um, looked like maybe a crane flyer or, or a I can't, it was something relatively large winged. But I almost got the sense that that starling adult was just hollering, look, fly that way. I mean, look, I've got this thing, fly away. And uh, I find it kind of heartbreaking to watch, actually. You know, like, I think it's awesome that the bird did this, but basically the, you can see the young starling kind of think about it and then just make the decision, oh, I'll just jump here first. You know, it's just sort of the way I imagined it. Jump there, and then you can see the hawks go. <laughs> and just, you know, again, the instinct in driving these animals is incredible. Just pounced, literally, talons out, and then proceeded to eat it. You know, and it's, it's the sort of thing where this is an animal that's never even flown yet, and yet is a fully, like, ready predator. Um, it was really impressive. At the same time, you know, Felt for the little style. <laughs> well, what was especially good about it was one of the moderators had just said something about, oh, you know, the young hawk, yeah, it has to, they'll catch him from flight, 
they yeah. won't go after it. And, then, oh. and that's a great example of just how we're all yeah. learning. You know, like right. I didn't really think that they'd ever catch it. Because, well, I didn't think they'd catch an adult. I didn't think that the young would fledge in the past, but they did. So Charles, we take maybe two or three more? Sure, and I'm happy to stick around if people have questions. Yeah. Uh, the third camera for the herons. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a question on where it will be. <laughs> well, it may actually be this very camera right here, depending on whether or not the camera that's up in the uh, nest tree is dead or not. Um, yeah, so this year we, we had a third camera that was really just uh, <laughs> a very jury-rigged affair. Um, that's something I didn't talk about in the talk, so I didn't think I'd have enough time, is that what underlies a lot of this um, bending technology to your will is experimentation. And in this case, it was me experimenting with a couple pieces of technology that I could get my hands on very easily and for a pretty low cost. And so I literally had um, a particular kind of camcorder that I had read about would probably work for how I wanted to use it. And I hit it wired up into this little box that was supposed to do everything all by itself and got those together. And it worked kind of, but like every day I had to futz with the thing. So it definitely wasn't a, and it was inside. It was just sort of a, a very beta kind of attempt to see what that view would look like from the building. Um, so was, that, that experimentation will definitely continue in the future, but we have a plan for how we would um, get a third camera on the nest tree, and it would likely be a, a large pan tilt zoom camera um, here on the building. So we've already looked into sort of how to make that work. It's just we need to look at sort of where the chips lay and how things shake out. I'd like a third camera too. I mean, it also begs the question of how we're going to display it on the page because already having two cameras is a little unwieldy. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you, or has anybody ever used a teleport lens instead of having to crawl in the nest? And I don't know the dog. <coughs> Yeah. So the question is whether I'm using a telephoto lens. So, for example, this from that building one instead of having the handcaps. Yeah. So uh, the the biggest tr the biggest problem with um, getting these live streaming setups to work is taking some piece of technology that's not really designed to live stream and then making it live stream. And um, live stream live stream dot com, our our partner, uh, has great software for working with like they're using tonight with a real camera connected over a connection that's stellar. But it's not really designed for the, the internet cameras that we're using because the amount of information ebbs and flows over the network. Okay, And, and so um, that's really the only place where we encounter problems with it. It's actually easier to use these cameras because they're, they're bomb proof. Um, they're, uh, I need mean one wire to take everything back, you know, and just plug into the wall. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing. So like this camera here, you can stick it out to negative 60. You know, all these cameras have heaters and blowers in them. Um, we're going to be demoing one this fall that has built-in infrared lighting in it as well. Um, so it's, it's uh, these are really well designed for what they do, which is observe things outside. So then we kind of have to, uh, you know, curve them just a little bit to get them to do what we want them to do. And, you know, despite the huge audience, we're not exactly a big market for the, the security <laughs> camera industry. Although Axis, <laughs> Axis has been really great to work with. They've actually um, great service. So, so one last question, and then we better wrap up. Yeah. How is this funded? Um, we're funded entirely by the support of members, viewers, donors, cam watchers. I mean, um, it doesn't cost the view. No. No, but people, people give. We encourage people to give too. Don't get me wrong, but um, but um, it's really been the the amount of uh, support, both both from funding, but also through kind of the sharing of this. You know, by getting people to watch. You know, people share to, uh, the number of times I see shares on Facebook, and is really you know that's why we're doing it. But we're um, you know we're the challenge is for us to be as uh, efficient as we can with the funds that we have. So that's why we make choices about where we put cameras, for example. Um, and we're always looking for new opportunities to partner um, with organizations that can help us achieve that same, that same mission. Yeah, so on that note, I just want to thank everybody who follows the CAMS, everybody who supports the CAMS. It truly is because of your generosity that we can do this and share it with so many people around the world. So 
Thank you for coming tonight, and Charles Little, stick around if anyone has more questions.